Welcome back, boys and girls, for another special edition of the Michael Deacon program. Joining me tonight is a very special guest, Andrew Razowicz, also known as the Psychic Firefighter. He is a renowned psychic medium with over a decade of experience connecting people with their deceased loved ones. He has been trained by Dr. Stephen Greer. Now, without further ado, let's bring in our guest. And with me now is Andrew. What's going on, my friend? Hey, Michael. What's up, man? Thank you for having me on. Long time no speak. It's always good to come on and catch up with you. Clockwise, it is always fun to talk to you, Andrew. And it has been a while since the last time we talked. And since it has been a while, I thought we could sort of refresh some memories out there right now, since I'm sure lots of memories are fried by this time. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a couple of years since the first time we connected and I came on your show. Yeah, so we could start from, uh, you know, way back and just go from there. Let's start from the very beginning. I mean, you are sort of known as the psychic firefighter. Explain that to some of the newer listeners right now, and then we can get into other amazing things that you will be involved in. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Cool. So anyone that's new out there or if you've heard of me before, we'll just refresh that. So basically. Um, I grew up in New York, and I grew up in Long Island, New York, and let's see, my father was a New York City firefighter, my mom was a teacher, came from a middle-class family, and growing up as a kid in the mid-90s, I used to watch that show on TV called Unsolved Mysteries, which was a big hit and a big classic, I used to watch it religiously, it was on TV, I'd be watching it or watching the marathons on, and uh you used to get that out there in, on the West Coast too, right? On oh, uh, absolutely. Great show. Yeah, classic. And, you know, it's interesting. I would watch that show with my grandmother who we'd sit for hours, man. We'd watch marathons and, you know, it used to be on Lifetime TV. And we'd sit there for the weekend sometimes just watching episode after episode through the night, through midnight. And, you know, as a 12, 13-year-old kid, it was like the coolest thing ever to stay right. late, watch, watching those shows and I'm hanging out with my grandmother who, you know, was into all that stuff. So we, an episode came on and there was a famous episode. I, I'll never forget this. There was a couple that drove down the road and they thought that they saw someone lying on the road. They thought it was like a lady lying on the road. Like it was like the lady in the road and they thought she was lying there naked and they drove past and they said, oh my God, did you see that? There was a woman there. So they didn't think much of it. They called the police. The cops came. They checked. There was nothing in the area. And then the next day, the couple was like, they got a real urge to go back. They're like, we need to go back there and look. Like, there's something there. And I believe they went back. They might have been with the police. But they go back to the site, and they found a sneaker in the road. And then they went down a ditch, and they saw a car that had crashed and there was a woman in there and I believe she had her child with her. And I believe the son had lived through this. It was like a fascinating case. And I remember watching this episode and I'm with my grandmother and the woman that was driving had died, but I just found it really interesting how, you know, a woman or a ghost on the side of the road was there. And it basically led people to a child that was alive and the woman that was dead already. But, the people that drove by in the car, they saw something, like something was going on that was strange. And I remember looking at my grandmother. I said, Graham, I said, one day when you die and, you know, you go up to heaven and you were grandpa, because my grandfather had passed away already, away already at that time. I said, can you let me know that you're OK? And she looked at me and she said, yeah, I, I promise I will. And I said, I don't want to see like a, a feather on the ground or a coin. 
you know, on heads like, uh, you know, or seagulls outside. I need to know it's you, like 100%. I, I want to see, like, what they see on TV, you know what I mean? Like, show me something really cool so I know 100% it's you. And she's like, yeah, I will. So we just left that alone. You know, like, I was 13 at the time. I didn't talk about it all the time. I didn't even tell anyone. You know, I didn't tell my parents, oh, Graham, you know, she guaranteed that she'd come through to me. Yeah. Nothing like that. It was just like, all right, whatever. Like, we just kept... We kept going on with the show and our conversation, and we just didn't bring it up again. So that's the mid-90s, you know, 93. So you go till the end of the 90s, like 99, right around there. And I was 19 years old, right around there, and I joined the U.S. Coast Guard. So I got stationed down in South Florida in an area called St. Petersburg, and I was on a 210-foot, what they call, medium endurance cutter. So it's a 210-foot-long boat, 72 crew members. There were 70 men and two women. And that's just how it was back in the day. You know, if there was one woman, they had two. They were never alone. And it didn't matter. Like, when you were out on a boat or you are out at sea, we're all like a big family. You know what I mean? There was no, like, oh, there's just two girls. It wasn't like that, man. Everyone was just cool. No one really cared about that stuff. And as long as you did your job, no one cared. You know what I mean? Sure. You just did what you had to do. Right. It was a very, like, you're out on a boat in the middle of nowhere. You got to do your job, man. Like, there's either doing it or you're not. So you got to really want to do that. You know what I mean? You're going out for a couple months out to sea. It's a serious thing. Yeah, you got to be committed, it. in other words. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, you're going out to sea, and our primary, you know, uh, mode of operation was right. mig migrant in interdiction. So, mm -hmm. like, if you had migrants trying to sneak into the country, uh -huh. you tried to intervene and catch them before they got into Miami because if you could get on the shore they had what was called the, the dry foot policy so if they got to land that's it they got oh to stay. I see yeah so right it, okay it was, a, it was it was a very you know touchy thing for the military because we were chasing around people trying to sneak in the country that were coming from Cuba of the countries that did not have good living conditions, at least in the late nineties that they didn't when I was in. And, you know, you felt bad for these people because sometimes we would catch them and I'll never forget this, but their skin was purple from being sunburnt so bad. And they were literally, they would come from Cuba or any of those countries in the Caribbean and they would get on a boat, not like a, you know, a nice boat, like literally they would just get on a boat and try to paddle to the shore and they would be they would get lost at sea and they would be at sea for so long that they're not putting sunscreen on so their skin would get sunburned from being out at sea and they would turn purple it was the craziest thing they literally were purple and um it was sad you know what i mean you felt bad wow man these people are literally risking everything coming from whatever country they're coming from trying to get to america and if we catch them in the middle right Maybe they'll get arrested. Maybe they won't. Mm -hmm. I know that most most people we caught, most of them, we'd arrest them. We'd, we'd call Cuba or wherever they came from and say, oh, you know, we have these people and their identification says that they're from Cuba. And Cuba would say, oh, no, no, they don't exist here. So now what do you do? Oh, wow, you know, yeah. You stuck with them. So the problem is, at least then, you know, back in the day, mm -hmm. We would we would take these people and they would be families, you know, husbands, wives, kids, right, aunts, yeah. uncles, and and you know, you, 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 we're not. There's no harm. We're, we're treating them respectfully and everything. But we would take them and we would bring them into Miami, and now they'd go to jail. And now wherever they're from, they would not be accountable, right? The country would say, "Oh, they're not from here." Now we're stuck with them. And most of the time, it, it by the time you figured out where they were from and legally did that, most of the time. We would just give them citizenship. We'd let them stay. Right. So, I figured that's what would ultimately happen. Yeah. So it was a crazy thing. So we were doing that, and we were also doing a lot of drug interdiction. So ah. what would happen? What would happen back in the day? And I'm sure it still does. They would have these speed boats, right? They'd have these little tiny boats with giant twin engines, and they would they'd be flying across the ocean, literally. And they would have a plane come by. The plane would come by, and they would drop out a giant 
bundle of bundle, cocaine yeah. a bale. or heroin mm-hmm. or whatever, a giant bale, literally a giant bale, like literally tons, tons of cocaine, heroin, whatever drugs were going on, meth, whatever. And then the speed wits would come by, pick them up and boom, gone. Now, by the time the Coast Guard vessel would come and catch them, they were gone, man. It's like impossible to catch them because our boat is only doing 18 knots. And just so like if your listeners don't know what that means, basically 18 knots is what we're doing. And those little speed boats, they're probably doing double to triple that. That's right. Yeah, so, they're, they're hauling ass mm-hmm. out there. You don't get, you don't stand a chance. And they're armed. So you, you're trying to in, intervene. And these speed boats, man, they got guns. They got machine guns. It's extremely dangerous. So just to set the tone for like what it was like for people that – you know, hadn't been in the military or what the conditions are like, you being on a boat like that, right, with 72 people, you're a pretty good trained observer because you need to be paying attention all the time. You're dealing with some real serious stuff. Yeah. You know, this is not like, oh, I got nothing better to do with my life. I'm going to join the military. No, this is real serious stuff, man. You're dealing with migrants and people that are in, you know, gangs and drug lords and all sorts of crazy stuff. And Back then, we didn't have the best relationship. And this was right in the and this was right in the beginning of your, I guess, career in this field, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. Um, you were fresh, in other words, and they already had you uh, in the thick of it. Yeah. Wow. And this is right at the time. Some people might remember. I remember I was in at the time. There was an issue down in Florida with a kid named Elion. Oh yes, that's right, Elion Gonzalez. Yes. 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 Yeah, I remember. I was I remember I was out at sea, and we were in Cuba when that happened. Damn, that's our, crazy. Yeah, I remember them telling us. It was New Year's Eve. Wow. They said, they said we just want to let you know that basically whatever – I don't remember everything, but what was going on there, they said if the U.S. doesn't give him back or whatever the situation was, that Castro was threatening to let out all of his prisoners – and we were in the sea of Cuba, and they said if that happens, the prisoners, right, and the people that live there, they were going to jump on speedboats supposedly and just flee to America because we can't catch all of them. Like there's no way. So it was hot, man. It was really dangerous. Tensions were flaring. There's a lot going on. And I'll never forget this, right? So I am the night watchman on my boat. I was what's wow. called you're, – you're either working – in the engine room, right? You're uh, what they call a firefighter in the engine room. That's just they call it a firefighter in the engine room. Or you work as a deckhand and you drive the boat and you monitor the boat. You're responsible for maintaining the boat, cleaning the boat. And then at night when you're out at sea, 24 hours a day, someone either drives the boat or you're monitoring the boat on the top deck. And I'll explain what all that means. So um, at the time, like I said, I'm like 19 years old. I am the night watchman, so I'm working from midnight till 4 a.m. And about every half hour, you rotate. So for a half hour, you drive the boat. And then one guy drives, and then the other guy, you're paired up with someone. One guy's driving, and then one guy is on top of the boat, what they call the flying bridge. So like the uppermost part of the boat, you're on top there, right? It's exposed. It's open. So you're out in the sea, you know, you're out in the ocean, in the middle of nowhere. All you see around you is total darkness, like yeah. you see around you. Pitch black. It's really out there. cool. You are what they call you're staring into the abyss. Right. <laughs> okay. Literally. And I had never seen anything like this, bro. Before that, like I came from New York. Yeah. You know you, what I mean? Yeah. I, I wasn't like a I wasn't like a boat guy. Yeah, you never went like, camping you know I mean? or anything like that. No, I like I didn't I didn't go out on a boat, nothing. I, I, I wasn't afraid of the water. So I was like, oh, yeah, I could do that, whatever. But I didn't do this. I didn't have any experience prior to this. I was learning as I went. Sure. So I'm the night watchman. I'm on top of the boat and there's a guy driving. I'm up top. And what you do when you're on top of there, you grab regular binoculars and you do a perimeter scan about every five to ten minutes. You're scanning the whole boat. So around, you look around you in the ocean, and then you look up in the sky, and if you see anything moving, you are to report down below to the officer on duty into what's called the bridge. The bridge is like the command center. So you have the radar men, you have the guy driving the boat, you have the officer on duty, you have a bunch of people in there doing different things, all the mechanical systems, everything is up there. Uh, the communication systems, the making sure everything is operating correctly, 
and we're also in an active duty stance. So we are actively looking for, like I said, there can be migrants coming in. There could be drug runners coming in. And if you see anything at all moving, you report it. You do that because worst case scenario, say there was an act of war, a time of war, right? And someone was coming at us, you would have to report that. Hey, sure. I see something, you know, 20 degrees off to the north. Something is crossing the front of our boat. That could be a threat. So legally, and I'm sure it probably is still today, legally, anyone that's out at sea or in the sky, if they are crossing the front or the rear of a military vessel, a Coast Guard or a Navy vessel, you are to get on the radio. There's a, a radio channel that everyone's supposed to be on. You're supposed to be on the same channel if you're out at sea because if there's an emergency or a boat is stuck or they're having a, a trouble, they should be able to call the Coast Guard right, and yeah. help. So it's for a safety thing. So I'm looking, I'm scanning the sky right with the regular binoculars, and I have military-grade night vision goggles. So the old-school night vision goggles, they weren't in color. When you look through them, it was like green. You know what I mean? Just I remember those, screen. yeah. Yeah, yeah, real, like maybe first generation, whatever. I don't even remember. Maybe it was one or two back in the day then. So I look at the sky, look around me. And very and heavy, sudden, by the way. Oh, my God, like a brick. Yes. Yeah, man. Like, They're like so too heavy. Bricks, man. <laughs> yeah, ridiculous. Now they're like a feather. It's great, man. But back in the day, horrible. So, like I said, I'm up there. I'm looking, and I remember looking off. I'm looking straight, just about straight for the front of the boat, just off to the left and up in the sky. Maybe, you know, I would say, I don't know, about midway up. So, I don't know, 45 degrees. So, just so your audience can keep it real generic. Midway up, if you're looking at the sky, just midway up, not all the way up, but just midway up in the sky, I see a round silver object. Now, I can see this with the night vision. All I can see, though, is something that looks silver. So I look with the regular binoculars. I could see it as well. I see like what looks like a whitish or silver object, and I see another one slightly behind it, staggered. So I'm thinking that's probably a satellite, but you know what? I'm not one to tell you what it is. I don't know. I have to call down regardless because anything that's moving, yeah. you have to report. So I call down below, tell the officer, boom. He calls back up. I give him the degrees, tell him what I see. Next thing I know, not even like two minutes later, boom, the officer is up on the flying bridge. And he's like, let me see those binoculars. So we're both looking. And next thing I know, there's like five other sailors up there. Then there's like 10. Then there's 15. Wow. So everyone's up there now. Something's going on. Yeah. yeah. All right. I don't know what this is. So they tell me that nothing was detected on the radar. Uh -huh. So that doesn't make sense because if it's a satellite, that should be detected. Should be there, no yeah. Problem. Easy. And if it's a military vessel or a plane or something that's really if anything that's flying or operating, as far as I know, should be detectable. So there's nothing being detected. That doesn't make any sense. So we're all looking. And it's probably about 10 minutes long, and the object, ob one object is just slight in front of the other one, and they're moving, and then all of a sudden, the objects merge together, and when they merge together, they don't shoot off in any direction. They just come together as one, and then they're gone. No trail, no trace, no sound. I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear an engine, no exhaust, nothing that could be seen from the night vision or the regular goggles, no trail, no exhaust when they were just there and then vanish, no trace. Now, as far as I know, okay, and asking, the, I only know because I'm asking the guys around me who had like 20 years out at sea, you know what I mean? These guys have been around and they were looking at me like, what the heck is that, bro? And I'm like, I don't know, man. I'm new, man. Like, I don't know. You tell me. What do you think? Like, <laughs> yeah. is that like a UFO? Or like, we don't know. I can't identify it. Right? We don't know what it is. It's flying in the air. It is an object. So I would take that as, all right, that's some sort of unidentified flying object. Or if it is a military experiment or some black government project that we don't know about. Now, I wasn't thinking that at the time. Sure. I'm just you're, saying yeah. if it was, though, and we, and we don't know, they didn't tell us, like I said, if a vessel, whether it's something in the sky or a boat or something crosses the front or rear of our boat and they don't identify themselves and they don't call in on the radio and say who they are, we have the legal right, at least we did in 1999, to shoot them. We had a 50 caliber machine gun. 
and two 25 cal machine guns on the boat. So we could have uh, we could have engaged. So if that is a test experiment, that was extremely risky to put us at harm, possibly. Not that that didn't happen, but I'm just thinking, wow, that was extremely dangerous if that was a test. Now, I don't think it was based on what I'm about to share with your audience after this. But at the moment, I saw something in the sky. I can't explain it. Everyone around me is just like, they have no clue. They don't yeah, they're know blown what it away. Is. Completely blown away, man. Like I, I've heard, you know, we'll get into this, but I've heard about like Nimitz and Canner and like, we were not doing a training drill. This is not an exercise, man. We were in an active duty. We were not training, bro. We were active duty out at sea. This is not an exercise. Like, it's one thing when you're doing a drill, you're exercising, and then you see something. That could be something as a test, and they don't tell you, and they'll never tell you, see how you're going to react. But we we were at live fire, bro. Like, we could have actively fired at this thing. So that would have been extremely foolish if that was a test subject. Now, I don't know for sure. I'm just saying, man, you put our lives at risk. And I don't know what else is out there. There could have been other military vessels, Navy vessels out there. I don't know. But you put everyone's life at risk if that was some sort of, you know, Lockheed Martin test thing, whatever that is, you know. But in 99, bro, I wasn't thinking about Lockheed Martin. No, I didn't of course even know not, what Lockheed yeah. Martin was, <laughs> you know. So I'm just like, hey, whatever. That's really cool, man, whatever it was. So we, we finish our watch. We finish our four-hour watch. Now, I didn't have to make an entry. I didn't have to report this. I didn't. I didn't get you know talked to after this. I didn't get taken in a room and talked to the men. In, you know, by the men sure, in black. Yeah. Nothing like that. And if I did, I wouldn't be having this conversation. Probably not. Be because <laughs> right. if that, if, if, I'll just tell you this: if that really happens and people get shook down, and you know stories like Bob Lazar or whatever, and you're shook down, and they tell you, "Hey, man, if you talk about this, we're going to kill you," you're not going to get the chance to go on the radio to go on George Knapp, to go on whatever, and share this, they're going to just take you away. You're gone. They're like, that's it. It's over. And they're probably not even going to threaten you. They're just going to follow you. And if you talk, you're going to disappear. So that I'm very skeptical when people come forward and say, oh, I know this. I have this information. I was told not to say anything, but I'm going to do it anyway. No, no, no. That's not how these things work. You have to have authorization to speak. If you were told, hey, you're brought in a room, and they say, hey, man, you don't talk, and then one day they say, okay, you can talk. You had authorization now to talk. But if you were never told anything like me, hey, man, I look at that as there's a reason that that didn't happen. So I'm able to share this with everyone, and there's right. a reason. You yes, know? And, and, of course, what you just said right now, you know, I want to sort of tag back to that as we go further along. And I bring in, sure. or not bring in, rather, but bring up. People like uh, David Grush, who just, you know, came out. He's that whistleblower. Um, we'll, yeah. we'll talk further into that, but let, let's continue on mm -hmm. with uh, your experience here. And no one else really yeah. made a big deal about it, it seems like. Um, I'm yeah. sure people were skeptical, but they were just following standard protocol, like you're explaining. Um, but this sort of um, conversation, there was no conversation, rather, between you and anyone else there. Um, so is that true? Yeah, so after, no one said anything, but it was also four in the morning by the time my shift ended. Oh, okay. Well, so, yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like Everyone no wants to go to like, sleep at that point. Yeah, got, and, and, and 20 of us saw this, but there's still 52 others that are asleep or whatever. So I can't wait till the morning. I'm like, hey, sure. you know, roll call at 0900. I'm going to get up and boom, we're going to talk. And so I get up in the morning. I go to roll call. I'm thinking they're going to debrief us because – they always go over anything. If anything comes up, anything strange, anything out of the ordinary, anything we need to be aware of, you need to let everyone know. So that way, you know, there's a saying in the Coast Guard, Semper Paratus, that means always ready. So you always need to be ready for anything, especially if you're out at sea and on what we call being underway and you're in an active zone like Cuba, man. Like that was serious stuff going down. Anything could have happened at any moment. So, hey, I don't know what that object was, right? We don't really know. Was that the? It probably wasn't. But was it Cuba? Was it the Russians? Was it China? I don't know. I can't tell you for sure at that moment. I have a pretty good idea now. But in that moment, I'm like, hey, they're going to debrief us or tell us something. Nothing was said. Nothing at all. So I asked a couple of guys that had sea time, a couple of guys that saw it after, guys that were out at yeah. sea for over 20 years, 
and they just said, Hey bro, you're going to see a lot of weird things out at sea mm. that, you know, I have seen weird things like that. Just, you know, just, just monitor it, keep an eye on it. It's okay to talk about it, but you, you'll get used to it. You know what I mean? Like you'll, you'll be like, Oh, okay. Another thing. It's just out there unless it's causing sounds like harm. They, yeah. It sounds like they've had experiences too. Oh, big time, bro. Sounds like it. Yeah. You know, there are so many people since I have talked about this publicly, you know, I didn't, I didn't share this man for, this is 99. I didn't share this for over 20 years wow. with anyone, nobody. Like I'm not, a, I, I don't have a problem with people want to do their own thing, but like, I'm not, on, I'm not on CNN right now and, and, and selling my story and telling it for the first time. No, dude, I, I just kept it to myself, dude. You know what I mean? It was like, whatever, man. Like, Hey, I saw this it was cool. I worked with a lot of people who are still in the military. So I said, ah, oh, I don't know if I want to share this. I don't want to put anyone in a weird position, but I reached a point where, hey, I could tell my side of it. I don't have to bring in names. I'm not going to tell anyone. That's that's irrelevant. I saw what I saw. I was never told not to say anything. So I want to share this with people. And I think it's important because now you have people coming forward and we'll get into this, but there seems to be an agenda, right? And 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 a reason why they're doing this. And a lot of it is negative. So we're going to get into my experiences with this after Okay, which this is only my experience. I can only tell you what I've seen, what I've interacted with, uh, which has been nothing negative. So I I consider that first experience what I saw. Uh, there was nothing bad. There was nothing negative. Yeah, they could have put us at risk, right? If that was military, but if it wasn't military, if it was something else, I wasn't threatened. I didn't feel in fear when I looked at it. I was just fascinated. I said wow, how is that thing moving like that? Like, that's really cool, man. What is that thing? And then they came together and vanished. I have never heard of anything like that before in my life. And this is this is really cool. And I saw it. So at that moment, I thought, Michael, wow, I'm just in the right place at the right time. And I'm just seeing this. That's and you were, yeah. You know, and, and maybe I'll never see it again, right? Like that's that and just whatever. Like I said, I didn't share this for 20 years because I didn't want to hear the ridicule. I didn't want to hear, yeah, right, okay, you're, you're crazy. You're crazy, yeah, you're out of your mind. You're, you were high, yeah. you were this, you were that. Yeah, and I don't have, like some of these people, I don't have the U.S. Coast Guard or the military behind me saying, oh, yeah, you have, you have, you know, you have access to talk about this. No one's saying anything, man, but I'm telling you, I saw the thing, and I remember everyone that was with me and what happened, and it was just really interesting, and it was the beginning of an amazing journey that I've experienced since then. So well, let me ask you this really quickly. Do you think yeah. that was one of ours or do you think that was from somewhere else? I, I, that is, that's definitely not from here. That was not one of ours. Not one of ours. Okay. Because what I could see uh, from what I saw of the craft, it would, like I said, it was silent, seamless. So from what I saw, I personally was looking with binoculars and everything I looked through, I did not see any sort of rivets or any creases, which I've heard, especially then, mm. if they have rivets or cracks, it's ours. That means we welded it, put it together at that time in that era, 99. From what I heard, we didn't have that technology for it to be seamless like that. Ah, That's so what I've heard. It was like one, uh, one then, piece, in other words. Exactly, exactly. Mm, and I didn't understand this at first. I thought all of them would have been constructed and welded together because as far as machinery of what I know, like a car, right? They have to weld it yeah. together and there's seams and cracks. I didn't know at the time that these craft are actually organic and they grow them, but we'll get into that. So I saw this and also I didn't have any fear. I, I literally, I looked at it. I felt like literally I was like a kid on Christmas morning, like, wow, that's really cool. Like, What's Santa going to pull out? You know, who's the guy behind the curtain now? Like, well, like, whoa, this is really cool, though. I'm not freaked out. And the guys I was with, no one was scared. We, were, of course, were concerned. Like, what is this? Is it a threat? But no one felt threatened. It was just like, okay, it's not coming at us, right? It wasn't coming at us. It was going, actually, it was moving away. So we were like, okay, that's interesting. It's not coming at us. We don't feel threatened. But nobody was freaking out. Like, oh, get, you know, man, the 25 cow, we got to shoot this thing down. Everyone was just like, cool, what is this? It's fascinating. And then literally when you're experiencing and you see these things, it's like time is gone, okay? Like there's no time. You're just in the moment, man. It's like everything is frozen around you in a way. It's a really weird thing. Uh, it's hard to explain. I wasn't paying attention to anything else. I was just locked into this thing. And I could just 
I was just looking at that. There was no, like nothing else was going on. It was really weird. But over the years that's happened, I've had really good contact experiences. I lock into this object and I'm just fixated on it. And it's like me and the craft and nothing else is going on. Um, yeah, man, it's, it, it was really wild. After this experience, Michael, I had heard about a guy named Dr. Stephen Greer who claimed that he had like 800 military witnesses that were involved with UFO programs and concealing the truth about UFOs and their existence. So he did a presentation in May of 2001. So I'm like, that's really interesting that he has all these military guys and maybe I could track him down, you know, like at some point. So in 2011, okay, I got on the New York City Fire Department in 2006. And then in 2011, I was able to track down Dr. Stephen Greer. I was on the internet, very minimal, very minimal. And I found him on like YouTube. And I'm like, wow, I want to meet this guy because I, I don't know about him. Maybe he can do what he says, but I don't know. I want to meet the people that he knows. I want to meet the military guys and maybe somebody there can help me to understand what I saw. You know what I mean? Like I want to get answers because I can't talk about this with anyone. It sounds crazy. You know, like I can't go to my family or, you know, like my grandmother, but the beside, you know, besides her, I man, I can't go to talk to people at work or in the firehouse. No, of course yeah, not. Sure. Yeah. Come on, man. Probably not a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a good way for them to get you a mental health evaluation. Yeah, they'll, so, they'll get you in trouble. <laughs> yeah, at that point, you know, 2006, 2007, no, I wasn't telling anyone that. So 2011, I fly out to the desert in California. I spend a week with Dr. Stephen Greer. He makes you sign a non-disclosure agreement, <laughs> right? For what? Right? What, is he going to sue you? Come sure. On. But at the, at the time, he didn't want you going and relaying half of a story or fabricating. So I understand what he's trying to do. He doesn't want people going there and then telling stories or lying. Or, but you're going to get that no matter what, man. That's just people. Absolutely, so yeah. I, I could care less, man. I had a great experience. So I share with people what happened there. I went, I just had an open mind and said, hey, let's see. Maybe it's possible. Maybe it's not. Whatever. I'm open to it. So I went out there with my partner at the time who was a New York police officer out in Long Island so me being a fireman and ex-military, and she was a police officer, I would say two pretty good trained observers, right? That's our profession. We are trained to observe hazardous scenes and to look for things and imperfections and, you know, things that don't look stable. So we were very observant. We were there. We were looking for what is the trick? What is this guy doing? You know what I mean? We're going to figure this out. So we're there, and the first night we go out into the field, there's about 20 of us. We're sitting in a circle meditating. Now, the first night, I didn't see anything personally. I just didn't. I don't know. I said, maybe I'm new to this. Maybe I'm, I don't have the same energy as these people. Maybe I'm messing it up. I don't know, but I'm just not seeing it. However, I go back to my hotel room, and Dr. Greer said, when you guys go back to your hotel room, if you have something happen in the middle of the night, you think you see something, just sit there and meditate and open up and, and see if you connect. So I was like, okay. So I go back to my hotel room. I'm not thinking anything's going to happen. I go to sleep. I wake up about three in the morning and I look at the bottom of my bed on the wall. There's a white wall there and we're staying in the desert in California in Borrego Springs. So that's the Palm Springs desert area oh, in yes. the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Very in the familiar. middle of nowhere. You know, yeah. Uh, so literally there's no electricity outside like nothing man where there's nothing going on at night there was an alarm clock but we unplugged it because i didn't want any lights in the room nothing that way if we see something i want to know for sure okay i know what i'm seeing i know it's the real thing it's not a reflection of the alarm clock nothing so we're in the middle of the night i wake up three in the morning boom there's a green light on the wall on the white wall i see it i wake my partner up i'm like yo do you see that? She's like, yeah. I get up, I get out of the bed, I go to the wall, and now the thing's gone. So it's like, oh, crap, whatever. I, I jump back into bed, boom, the thing reappears. It's a green, small light, like the flash on a camera. It's the size of a Tic Tac, literally like that, like an ant. And the thing moves up the wall about two to three feet. So I knew this was something, because now it moved, okay? There's no way something could have moved. And we were in a room, nothing else going on. We're staring at it. We're looking at it. The thing just flashed, 
about every minute, just it like pat what I call powered up, like a, almost like a lightning bug would, but it was not a bug. Okay, this thing was there. It felt intelligent, meaning it knew that I knew it was there. It was observing you observe it. Yes, I could feel it. It knew that wow. I knew about it. Okay, so now I don't want to move. I'm like, I'm not getting up out of the bed. I don't want to go up to the wall. Let me just leave it. And we just sat there. We meditated. And from three in the morning until the sun rose, the object was there. And then when the sun rose, it just vanished. So it felt like there was a giant mothership or something outside. But I didn't get up to look because I didn't want to lose that interaction because of what happened earlier. I just said, let me just stay and enjoy the moment. And it felt like, like I said, this thing was intelligent. And I felt like they were kind of just checking us out to make sure we weren't going to freak out and we were okay with the contact. So I just laid there and chilled out and meditated. And it was a beautiful experience, man. And then the sun rose. We, we, we got up and we went to the villa that Dr. Gray was staying at. And we went in there and we were talking and he's like, all right, did anyone have an experience in their room last night? And of course, I raised my hand, explained to him what happened. And he goes, well, what did you think it was? What, what do you think? I said, well, it felt like there was a big craft outside and they sent like a probe in the room. And he looked at me and he goes, exactly. That's what they will do. Because seeing a giant craft with something huge for the first time can be pretty intimidating. I said, yeah. I think if I just saw that the first time, whoa, that close to me would have been a big thing. He goes, so a lot of times they will ease you into the contact mm. and it won't, it won't be so you know, intimidating right away. It's like, all right, cool. So from that moment on, Michael, literally that during the day, this is 10 o'clock in the morning. From that moment on until this very day, every single day or night, depending what I'm doing, when I meditate, I'm able to communicate with them, okay? We started meditating in the room after that happened, and then during the day, we started to see golden balls of light floating through the room. We saw them at night. Now, back then, I wasn't taking photos. I wasn't taking video. I could care less in 2011. I didn't want to take photos, and I didn't want to argue with people like I do now, whether they're real or not. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, it's, yeah. it's crazy, bro. It's such a waste of time because what's really behind this and the real phenomenon, that's what we should be focusing on. The videos and all this nonsense, the eyewash, I call it. Yeah, it's great if it's real, if you could validate and get it you know, officially approved by MUFON. But who cares the experience when you're there in the flesh and you're making contact? You can't even put it into words. A picture or video doesn't do justice. There's a lot of... um. A lot of military facilities out there, naval facilities, I should say, around here, in California, and mm -hmm. um, that area, your area, you stayed in, uh, no exception. Lots of weird things happen out here in the desert. That's for sure. <laughs> I've heard, I've heard, and I know we were also near a Native American burial land or, or burial ground. So one night when we were out there, we're meditating, and there's a craft we see. People are filming it, videos, pictures. I have real photos and uh, I have photos from that expedition on all of my socials. I'll post them again so after this, so everyone could see. And people, not me, but people in the group took photos and posted pictures of craft, mostly orbs and lights in the sky and weird things like that. This is going back to 2011, and it's a while ago, man. It's a while now, yeah. Them. Yeah, yeah, man. This, I, we didn't have iPhones and good cameras, nothing like that. And I didn't have any of it. I yeah, isn't it crazy, though, you you look back at like 2011, 2012, uh, up to now, and you're like, whoa, mm -hmm. things uh, really have um, gone up in quality. It's incredible, man. I think back then, maybe I had a 35 millimeter camera, or I don't know if I had a camera phone. That I don't even remember. I, I was not taking any photos, though. Might have had a good regular camera, but that was about it. I didn't want to be distracted. I didn't want to be bothered with a camera sure. a flash, you know, like whatever, man. So I just wanted to enjoy that moment. I and miss those days when no one really cared about a cell phone too much. Uh, you know, I did not, like I said, I didn't have a cell phone. And when we were out with Greer at night, I liked it because he goes, don't even think about bringing your phone. Do not even, if you have one, don't even bring it. I, if there's an emergency, we get abducted too bad. We're like, oh my God, all right, whatever, man. But he goes, we're out in the desert. It's not going to work anyway. So like, That's all right, true. Cool. So we just left it. And you know what, man? It was great. We were just in the moment. 
We were all talking, hanging out, and we had a actor show up from for this Hollywood guy that you might have heard of and people might know, Thomas Jane. He played the Punisher. He was in the show on HBO called Hung, uh, Battlestar Galactica. He's a Hollywood guy, and he showed up and he spent the week with us doing CE five. So it was really cool, man, to know that. Wow, th- once again, this is in twenty eleven. So now, yeah, people talk about this in Hollywood. It's a cool thing. It was not then. In 2011, it was not the end thing. So this guy came and he was like, yeah, you know, don't say anything to anyone. You know, nobody knows. It could ruin my career. And now, you know, who cares? But back then, yeah, back it was, then like, it was oh, a big God. deal. Yeah. Dude, it was, I was worried back then in 2011, Michael, that if guys in the firehouse found out, they'd put me in a psych ward because it's crazy. Like on the surface, it sounds crazy. I get it. There's lights in the sky. You're chasing them around. And I don't know what's crazier, to not have photos and videos or to have them, right? Is it crazier to say, hey, man, I'm seeing them, but you don't have any proof? Or, hey, man, look at what I did this week, and I got photos and videos. Guys would think you're even wacky. You're like, oh, dude, you're filming it now? Dude, now you're really crazy. Yeah, now you have you know, issues. Like, <laughs> yeah, I could understand that, especially, especially firefighters, too. You know, I'm sure you would get ribbed nonstop. You know what it is? They're, they're always going to find something to make fun of you about this whatever your imperfection is whatever it is man they're gonna hammer you so once this came out of the bag right so i came back from meeting greer i come back i was just gonna say quickly one night we saw a coyote out in the desert right it was walking by our group right we had a craft in the air we saw a coyote we got it on film somebody filmed it with their video recorder the next day we looked at the footage there's no coyote on the film Mm. nothing so I heard that some of the Native American spirits or even the extraterrestrials will shapeshift or change appearance. I can tell you, I can't tell you what it was, but something changes its appearance. Or there was a coyote, bro. We all saw it, all of us. And the next day in the video, there's nothing there. We all saw it. There's either a mass hallucination like John Kill would talk about or something shapeshifted. I don't know. I, I don't know. But we all saw the same thing. And it was not there, man. So, and we were not drinking, no, no drugs. Like I said, it was a firefighter, none of that stuff, dude. No drinking, nothing at all, then. Like, Greer was real strict with that, man. Like, he didn't want any interference because you want to know for sure what you're seeing. If you're stoned, if you're on ayahuasca, if you're taking mushrooms, I don't have anything against that. That's not for everyone. That's some people's thing. But you have to always wonder oh, is that real or am I hallucinating? Yeah, or is it a figment of my imagination? And, with where I'm at today with this, right? yeah. many, many years later, I can't have this conversation with people saying, oh, yeah, I did mushrooms for the last 10 years and I saw this. People don't want to hear that. Whereas I can say, no, 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 I saw the stuff sober in a clean state, no drinking, no nothing. I completely saw this with my own eyes and I had witnesses. So I'm not nuts. I've seen this and now I film this. I photographed this over the years. I finally gave in. But yeah, man, I've been seeing the same stuff, and it's evolved over time, no, no doubt about it. Um, coming back from that, Michael, guys eventually found out because eventually I went on the internet. I started networking with people online, sharing my story. And then in 2018, the New York Post dropped an article about me. Uh, I believe it's July of 2018. Um, there's an article written about me. It says, you know, FDNY firefighter claims he sees angel, uh, angels, ghosts, aliens at, at the firehouse, right. or whatever. And yeah, it's true. Everything they said is 100% true. If I said it, if it came out of my mouth in the interview, I back it up. Now, when you channel, when you communicate, when you make contact, yes, a lot of interesting things happen that sound bizarre, that sound crazy to the regular person. However, with the conversations we're having today, like Rush and all these people and the things they're talking about. If you look back to the article that was written about me, I've been talking about this for years. The same thing, man. I've been saying it. I didn't have CNN behind me. I wasn't going on national news. I just had my story. And that's it, man. And I just shared what I experienced. I've been saying the same thing, the same thing that mainstream media and all these people are finally talking about. Oh, there's ETs. There's ETs on the craft. There's bodies. Yes, there are. I've been saying it forever. It's just finally 
the mainstream is catching on to this. Right. We'll, we'll get it. We'll yeah, get we'll, we'll it. talk about that for sure. And going back to um, the, the house here, the firefighter house, who was it that um, essentially, I was going to say ratted on you, but I don't want to say that. <laughs> so I started to go online. I Actually, let, let, people. let me put it this way. Who was it who stooged you off? There we go. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, basically someone, you know, I was working with people and then, People found out. Now, also in the middle of this, I have to, this is a very important thing. I, I come back from meeting Greer, right? I meet Greer, I come back, and then my grandmother passes away. So my grandmother passed away, and three weeks after she passed, I'm in a restaurant in town where I grew up eating dinner with my mom, and a guy walks in. He's got long hair, earrings, comes up to me and my mom, and he says, someone in your family just died. They had cancer on the outside of their face, and it spread said yeah and he goes which one of you was born on easter sunday and my mom was born on easter sunday in uh -huh. 1954 so i go okay that's pretty specific i mean i i don't share that with many people about that detail but i go okay who is this guy and what the heck's going on this big guy with leather you know leather jacket and earrings in his ears what's going on man and he's like oh i'm a psychic medium my name is robert hansen i'm like oh okay cool he's like i'm doing a reading here at at the restaurant i'm like oh yeah yeah no problem man you know it's all good no problem man you know i'm open to that stuff whatever my mom's cool with it uh so i wait a year a year i track this guy down i go to him i record it and i still have the recording to this day i recorded it when he read me a year later all different things came through none of the same things from that first time the end of the reading he says to me you know you have the gift i said what are you talking about bro he goes, you have the gift of being a psychic medium. I'm like, no, I'm a firefighter in Brooklyn, bro. What are you talking about? Like, I'm not yeah. a psychic. Like, what? So he's like, no, no, you, you've meditated, right? I said, yeah, yeah. He goes, and, and you've had some experiences. I go, yeah, but I don't know. Like, I do what you do. He goes, I said, okay, how? He goes, come here on the weekend and I'll show you. I'll help you interpret the messages. I'm not going to make you psychic. You're a psychic already. You got it. So I was like, in my head, I'm like, yeah, he tells everyone this. Hmm. You know what I mean? Right. Got to be a scam. There's a hustle. Money. Yeah, I'm not dumb, but like, bro, I'm in Brooklyn, I grew up in New York. I know people that are scam artists. I'm not saying he was, but I'm I'm skeptical. I'm like, what's the catch? Right, so, right. All right, I'll go there. I'll go to his little class and see what's up. I go there. I sit. We meditate for a few minutes, right? There's about 20 people I've never met. I'm in a room. I don't know anybody. Meditate for five minutes. I sit and meet and meet with a lady. I say to her. I see a car driving down the block backwards. It hits a tree, and this guy gets his left leg amputated, and I'm seeing the letter V, V, V. She's like, oh, that's my Uncle Vinny. So I was like, okay. Now, the first time this happened, Michael, of course, I'm like, yeah, right. She's got to be lying, right? There's a scheme. They're all connected. They're all working together. They wrote me in and, you know, whatever it is. Sure. Well, I started going there every weekend and training, doing psychic development. So it was $20 for three hours of training, but you're in a room with like 20 to 30 people. So you have, for me, if I'm gonna do something, bro, I don't do it like 5%, I do it 110%. That's just me, I, I that's the trade I have. So if I'm in, into it, I'm doing it, bro, I'm going all the way. So I sat in the front row, I recorded every time I was there, I have them all on my phone still. I listen to the old recordings once in a while, man, just to refresh myself. I sat in the front row. I learned as much as I could. I was like a sponge. And then finally, bro, after months and months of doing this, then finally I go, okay, I'm really doing this. Like I had to convince myself. You were in everyone, at that point, yeah. Yeah, everyone around me was telling me. But And right off the bat, they're like, oh, you should be doing this. This is your calling. But listen, like anything in life, until you look yourself in the mirror and go, okay, it's time. I'm ready to go all in. Because like I said, when I do it, I'm all in. So when I make that commitment, though, there's no returning. There's no going back. Like, I don't care what happens. I'm all the way in. So I got all the way in. So I'm going to the firehouse, right? Working my job, doing my 24s. I do my two 24s a week. And then I got a couple of days off. And my days off, I'm going to friends' houses. And then a couple of guys in the firehouse found out. Mm. How did they find out? I went to a public event with the guy that trained me, the psychic that trained me, he did a public event. I went to the event and I ran into a guy from the firehouse. Ah, uh, I see. So, he, so he's like, bro, what are you doing out here? This is like two hours from where you live. I go, oh, I, I trained with him. He's like, really, you, you do this? I said, yeah, I, 
yeah, I just keep it kind of quiet, but yeah, I'm, I'm still, because, you know, it's early on. You're like, like hey, shut up I'm about it already. On. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Tell I don't them right. everyone <laughs> yeah. Knows, that, uh. so the next time I go into the firehouse, everyone knows. Oh, like, boy. You know, they, ha they have, uh, you know, all sorts of like angels and blow up, you know, aliens oh, wow. all wrapped around my locker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all good. Hey, well, I mean, I mean, they, at least it shows that they cared. Mm hmm. If they're not talking about you or doing that, there's a problem because you want to be part of the mix. If right. they're not saying anything to you, well, that's not good. That's not a good sign, yeah. So, you know, they, yeah. they uh, obviously they like you and they're just sort of busting your balls, that's all. They grab their, it went from that to the biggest, roughest, toughest, most gritty guys that you could imagine calling me, grabbing me on the side. Yo, bro, I need to talk to you after work. Yeah, what's up, man? Hey, man, you know, my, my mom died. Can you help me out? Yeah, of course, man. Come to my house after work, no problem. Hey, man, I saw a UFO when I was a kid. I don't tell anyone here, man. I don't want them to know. I said, I'm not going to tell anyone. I'm not going to do what you guys do. I can't, I got your confidentiality. So I have read more guys than you could imagine that I work with and other guys in other houses and people I met through online. I've read them. I've read their spouses. And best of all, I've read like an extended family member that I don't know at all. So that way there's no way to connect. Oh, well, you know this about my family. No, I don't know anything about you. I don't know anything about you and your family in Mexico. So, right? So I always like to read people that I don't know anything about, preferably that way. There's no way of saying, oh, well, you could know that about me or you know a friend of me. No, I don't know anything about you. So that way for me too, as a psychic, I know, okay, I don't have any preconceived notion mm. in my head. Now doing this for a long time, Michael, that, that's gone. I don't have that thought anymore. But early on, I wanted to make sure there was no possible way that the person I'm reading could think Oh, well, they know that about me already, you know, so they're, they're just like fishing. No, no, man, I am doing this out of the, out of, I, I, when I read, I am doing this from my heart. And what I mean is they did a study called life after life. There's an HBO special and there's a book written called life after life. They did a study with psychic mediums in like the eighties or nineties. One of the psychics that they studied was the guy that trained me, Robert Hansen. They also trained John. Uh, they also did John Edward, George Anderson, all these psychics all over the world. What they did was they connected the psychic on, on. They connected his brain and his heart up to a computer, and then they had a wall in the middle, and they had someone sitting on the other side of the wall, but they couldn't see them, so they didn't know who they were reading. They didn't know anything about them. So what they did was they had to, they had him read. They said, "All right, tell me about him. What are you picking up?" And they just had to channel and say what they saw. The test concluded, right? The result they got was somehow the brain of the psychic was connecting to the heart of the person they were reading. Oh, wow. So if our memory, right, a memory of our loved ones, if that's stored, right? Like when you think about someone you love, right? You think about your heart, like, oh, my God, I love them. I can feel it. Oh my, God. my hair stands up, right? I really love my parents, my grandparents. You know what I mean? I think about them with my heart. So when you're reading, right, you're using your mind. So I'm using my mind to read the person's heart. So like that's how I know because they did the study on the guy that trained me. And he taught, you know, when you think, when you meditate, you know what I mean? You get centered, you get grounded. And they, they say like that expression, you know, you have an open heart, open mind, right? So open mind, open heart. When I read what I do, I am open. I'm wide open like that. And I know based on the study – because I'm doing it legitimately. I know because a guy told me who's doing it legit, and I've been doing this now for 13 years. I'm connecting somehow with people's hearts over and over and over over these years, and I'm connecting them with their deceased loved ones, answering questions for them about you know past events, future events. Now, no one can predict the future. What we can do is give you a high probability based off of information we see, but you can't say, oh, uh, you know, in three months, you know, this is going to happen. You're going to get a job. You're going to be in love. No, 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 that's bullshit. No one can do that. So because if they, that was true, I would have prevented the next terrorist attack. I wouldn't be talking to you. No offense, but I'd be working with the feds. Right, of course. It, you know what I mean? Well, yeah. I'm not, like, it, 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 it's, I would be doing this to uh, better humanity and prevent my child and other people from having a horrible life. You know what I mean? And And preventing things. So if anyone can predict the future – or they can time travel or do whatever it is. Don't even tell me. I don't want to hear about you on an interview anywhere. Go call the CIA or the FBI and go solve the next mystery or the crime or find the missing kids. Please just do it. Don't, don't even tell me. Just do it because right. I'll tell you that one thing I am working on, I'm being straight with you here. I haven't talked about this much, but 
I am in the process of working with other, there's a couple of the psychics. We are in the process of doing that. We are in the experimental phase. Like I said, we're not there yet, but we're working on some missing persons and missing children type cases. Oh, so, that's good. I mean, that's a noble cause in my opinion. I, I see nothing wrong with that. I'm giving it a whirl, and I'm doing this because, too, the guy that trained me, Robert Hansen, what I really liked about him was for 10 years he worked with the FBI. Okay, He worked with the federal government, the FBI, and they sent him over to Japan, and he was there doing psychic work trying to find missing children. And he told me, he said, Andrew, they have the best psychics in the world doing this. He goes, it's almost impossible. It's, he goes, because if it wasn't, he goes, they would solve – the Gilgo Beach murderers, right? Who did the murders, right? If they had the best psychics in the world there, which they do, they tell you who did it, done, the case solved. So the souls there can't tell us, hey, he murdered me. Because if they could, that thing would have been solved, just like all these other mysteries. So I'm not saying it's impossible. Once again, I'm not saying it's impossible. Right, I, I hear want, you. I, I want to try to be open to the possibility that, that it might be, but I, I, I really trust people that I've trained with and I listen to them. I, I do listen to what they have to say. I respect that. By the way, as you were saying that to me, you know, I couldn't help but think of one name that came to mind when you said missing children, and that is one Sylvia Brown. And I think I've mentioned her name oh, to you before. Um, I, I don't know why her name just seems to go hand in hand anytime I hear of <laughs> psychics and missing children. I'm like, oh, Sylvia Brown. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and, you know, it's a shame that there are certain psychics out there. Like it that. happens, and, though. You know, what can you do? <laughs> It's like anything, right? There's bad podcasts, right. there's bad people in the news, there's bad presidents, there's bad everything. So you got to pick and choose what you want. What I'll say is like anything, if I was choosing a new job or I was going to go work somewhere, wherever it was, I, I worked as a firefighter, right? I, I working in a funeral home, right? I was an embalmer in, in Australia. Here. Right. And when I went there, right, and I went brand new, I want to go train with someone. Not that it's been there for six months. I want to find the guy that, or girl that's got 20 years. Show me the ropes. So like anything, if you're going to get read or you want to find a good psychic or a good anything or a good job, go there and say, all right, how much time do they have? Yeah, you need experience. someone with skin in the game for many years. I, I trained with a guy at the time who had 20 plus years as a psychic. So I go, I'm going to relate that to being like a firefighter. You know what I mean? All right, man, this guy's been around. So and he's still going. Most of these psychics, they come and go and they don't last because they're not doing it. And, and it sounds corny, but you want to say they're not doing the right thing or they're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart. Call it what you want. They're not doing what they should be doing. They're doing to rip people off or whatever it is. And like Sylvia Brown, it always catches up with them. Absolutely. And you know what? Going back to that article that the New York Post wrote about you, I think that was actually back in 2018 when it was released. And yeah. I remember reading about that, uh, reading the article. And I think they said something like you had captured footage of four seven-foot-tall light beings, by the way. Yes. Yeah, so at first, like I said, years ago, I wouldn't film anything Well, with an iPhone. Wow, this technology got so much better. So in 2017, it was actually after midnight on 9-11, but in 2017, I, it was just a wild experience. But I'm at work, and I literally – I was the night watchman, so – uh, from midnight till eight in the morning, someone has to be by the fire trucks and the front door just in case someone runs up to the door and bangs on and says, oh, my house is on fire or whatever. You have to have someone always there. So one guy's got to do what we call the bomb, the late watch. So that was me. So it's 9-11, right? And always on 9-11, man, the energy is weird. It's off. Ooh, you know what I mean? I bet, yeah. yeah. You know, you know, man. So like I, I'm just up anyway. I'm just jacked up. I'm up. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting in a chair. I'm watching TV. And I just hear in my in my head, look straight out the window, like literally look by the truck. So I'm like, what? So I look by the trucks, and I can see what appears to be four, it looks like, seven, eight-foot-tall gray things with black eyes. Now, that sounds crazy. So I was like, no one's going to believe this. So I pull out my phone, and I film it for 12 minutes, and I take photos. Now, I didn't release these because it's on fire department property. And I don't want to have a lawsuit in my hands or anything like that. You know what I mean? Right. I have it. I have the footage. I am retired now, so it's different. And I have had the footage, footage analyzed and looked at. And it will be getting released. So it will be released. That that was my next oh, question. Yeah. Okay. Of course. Of course. Ah. Absolutely. So 
the footage is genuine. I've had filmmakers look at it. How did you do this? Am I, I getting? Uh, am I going to get early access to this uh, footage, Andrew? That's what I want to know. Oh yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> okay, of course. Well, I'll just go ahead. <laughs> so there are these beings, and and um, in the meantime, too, I'm seeing that, and I'm also looking to my right, and I could see the apparition, the outline, but it was full. It was like the outline, the apparition in a deceased state. So this person is not alive, but I could see, and I did get on film, someone I had worked with who passed away in a fire. So they were in the firehouse in a deceased, so they're not alive, right? Because they're deceased, but they were literally like dressed for work. So it was interesting. So picture a person that's not alive, they're not present. They're not. They're they're in a deceased state, but they look to me dressed to work, and that is captured on this footage too. So it was fascinating. It was. I would like once again. I'm not freaked out because I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, if I had seen this on day one, I might have said, "What the heck, man? This isn't for me. Yeah. This is crazy." A different I don't story. Know. But I've been around. You know, what I mean, I've been around. I've been seeing this stuff. So just like, all right, whatever, man. It's just the whatever, man. I guess they feel safe with me. So no problem. So the the phrase or the term angels in the firehouse, okay, is because I have had sightings, I've had interactions at work with what I consider an angelic type beings, okay? So someone that I had worked with was a good person who passed away at work, who I still see in the firehouse, I can still see them. I consider that an angel because the communication I'm getting from them is, okay, that they are looking out, they're guarding the firehouse, they're there. Now these light beings that I saw, these seven foot tall light beings that I saw, they did not have mouths, so they did not speak to me. When they're in an angelic form or an ET form or a, you know a afterlife form, it is telepathy. So you're getting what you wanna call a download or information sent to you, and that is the information I got. It was not a fear, it was just, we're here. We're always here. We're keeping an eye out. We're guarding. We're protecting. We're looking at the firehouse. So I said, all right, cool, man. I don't have a problem with that. I'm not going to go into the kitchen in the morning and tell all the brothers. You know what I mean? I'm just going to leave this to me and maybe a couple of people, but I don't want to freak anyone out. And I don't really want to go into the psych ward this, this winter. You know what I mean? So I'm going to leave that sure. alone. Leave that one alone. Seeing, talking about something, filming it, photographing it at home is one thing. Saying it's in the firehouse and you have footage, you know, yeah, you're seeing it or whatever you're different up. there. Yeah, like, like once again, this is touchy, man. But I am retired now, so I don't, I don't care. I'll talk about anything. It is what it is. Right. It's a true thing. And I will tell you a true story. I had heard when I was on the fire department and before and after, after 9 11, I had heard of several guys that died on 9 11 who their apparition was seen in the firehouse they used to work in. Now, I have heard this over 20 different times. So someone dies on 9-11 and their ghost or apparition or soul, whatever you want to call it, is seen, but it's being seen by guys they used to work with and guys that they didn't work with. So like someone new comes in and they go, hey, man, I saw something standing in the corner. And the guys are like, oh, that's so-and-so. But this guy never met him. So he's like, how could he know what he looks like, right? They don't even know him. So that proves like, hey, man, there's something. Yeah, they're, they're seeing there's, something. Yeah, there's not your imagination. Because like when you're grieving, right, when you're going through things, it is possible that you think you're seeing something. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're imagining it. You have to, you have to put that into perspective. However, if you're filming it, if you're photographing it, if there's a group of you seeing it, you're either mass hallucinating or no, you're seeing it. I think you're seeing it, but I don't yeah. think it's a hallucination. I think there is a veil that when you're in a meditative state or you're stressed or I don't know, just at some points, there's a little entry point where the souls or the ETs or whatever is out there, they see someone who is open to this and they go, hey, man, we want to just say hi for a minute. And they just come in. You basically say, what's up? We're OK. And then shh, they're gone. My goodness. Well, I am looking forward to seeing this footage that you have of these seven foot tall <laughs> light beings. I'm quite excited. And of course, I will relay that message back to you guys, those of you listening about that. Once that comes to fruition, and uh, my God, Andrew, we could, we could talk about so many different things here, but I think we should sort of 
go back to what's been going on right now. Well, I shouldn't say we should go back. We should move forward here and uh, talk about some of the latest uh, developments of what's been going on. You know, Marco Marco Rubio, I remember, he was claiming he had heard firsthand accounts of UFOs from high-ranking government officials. I mean, that's been making the waves. And, of course, uh, your boy, Mr. Greer. He also <laughs> yeah. um, threw a bit of a... A conference, I recall, earlier this oh, month, yeah. I, I recall it was, right? Might have been like on the 17th or something. Yeah, and I have to say... Actually, June I had never heard. June 12th, actually, he had the UFO Disclosure Project. There we go. That conference. Yeah, yeah and, his, and his witnesses, I had never heard of them. They were all first-timers for me, and that was pretty powerful hearing those stories and the trauma and stuff that these guys experience, and... Once again, you have to think, you know, what do these people have to gain? You know, people that have experiences, they're retired, right? There's no agenda. Then, then, you know, they're not on CNN. They're just coming forth, sharing their story to help. And I love those organic type stories, those raw stories of people with no agenda. They just want help or want answers, kind of like what I experienced. I wanted just answers. I wanted to just figure out what was going on. There was no agenda. There was no unanimous source. And that's what I liked it about what Greer did. These guys were speaking firsthand where there's also other people and politicians saying, oh, I've heard from sources or unanimous sources. That's going to get us nowhere. We need to talk about the names, the times, the places enough. Like you want to blow the whistle, blow the whistle then, man, and drop names and say, hey, I saw this there. But this this runaround that's been going on forever. Oh, yeah. I mean. Oh, my God. It's the same dog and pony show. So why is anything going to change? It doesn't make sense for disclosure from a military standpoint. It doesn't make sense from a governmental standpoint to, you know, reveal this unless they want to weaponize space, which they have been. And if there's a threat, but if they're peaceful and they're loving, they're not going to get funding for that. That's going to take away funding. So, of course, they're laying out these little seeds, but ultimately they're saying, oh, it's, you know, they're malevolent. Basically, they're, they're evil. They're malicious. They're demons. We don't know what we're dealing with. They are so full of it. They know exactly what they're dealing with. The thing is, they're, you know, I, I believe there's a struggle going on between people that want to talk about the truth and reveal that there's a peaceful contact going on and experience. And then there's the people from the industrial complex and military industrial complex that want to feed that agenda and that cash cow and keep that going forever. And if they reveal the truth that they're peaceful, that's going to pull their money away. And, you know, to have world peace, why would they want that? They need to keep us, you know, at a low vibration and in fear and dumb and dumbed down to have us enlighten and awaken and unify. Uh, I mean, think about this. doesn't matter what our religious background is. doesn't matter where you're from. I talk to anyone. And to think, all right, maybe we're not alone. Most people can have that idea. Unless you're totally against that, right? Some people could say, yeah, that's possible. Imagine everyone coming together and having confirmation of that, regardless of where you're from, and seeing something that's not from here and us coming together as one in peace and something coming and confirming, yes, I am from wherever or I'm from in the inner earth, I'm coming out. And I don't care about your religion or your background. I just come in peace. I want to see you guys thriving. I mean, this this is the answer to world peace, as far as I'm concerned, is the E5, is coming together peacefully. But this negative fear agenda, we are just going to stay in this crazy same cycle forever and be in this endless cycle of karmic reincarnation forever and ever. And these people out there, that are feeding this, they know better. That's the thing. They know better, man. And they're just feeding into it to either keep their pockets lined or to keep their pension or whatever it is. And I am just sick and tired of it, man. I just have no part of that, man. I'm here for what I've experienced. And I've never had in over 20 years of seeing that from 99 till now, you know, so I've over 20 plus years, I've never had one thing that put me in fear or worried for my life right. or safety, nothing. Yes, um, some of the claims that we heard during that, um, I was going to say conference, I, I guess it was a conference, sort of. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's what it was. Michael Herrera was there, a former U.S. Marine who claimed to have witnessed a man-made UFO during a 
humanitarian mission in Indonesia and believes it was part of a human trafficking operation. I mean, those are some pretty wild claims, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. The truth, once again, the truth, disguising it as E.T., right, and then go back to all these abductions. Now, Gria told me from day one, he goes, they're not abducting us because if they were, they wouldn't need to take you at all. They, don't, they, they need to take you to take your DNA. He said, Andrew, our DNA is sprinkled all over the earth. All they'd have to do is pick up your hair or anything. They don't need your body. And, and a 500-year or a 1,000-more-year advanced civilization, they have moved past the point of poking and prodding and torturing people because if they have not, they would have destroyed themselves with another species through war, which is the route we're going, which that's not going to happen. They will intervene because it will affect the fabric of space. Okay, so they would intervene if they came to that. They want us to learn on our own, like being, you know, our own children. We have to, right. you know, p police ourselves. So, yeah, how sick is that? If that's a human trafficking thing and they're disguising that as a craft that people that would take it or abduct it. That is oh pretty nuts. That is pretty nuts if that was the case. And <laughs> it was uh, our, <laughs> my government abducting yeah. uh, children and other thing, other people and. Uh, doing all kinds of weird experiments and that was actually the cause of all these millions of people that go missing every year it was actually our own government doing some sort of weird experiment on them imagine if that were the case andrew i mean that would that would be a significant blow i mean maybe that's part of the reason uh, one faction of uh, the government is totally against this and one faction is all for it to reveal all these sort of things that have been that have been going on since the 1940s or 30s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and think about it, as long as people think they've been getting abducted and they're on a craft with all these people, and imagine that was just some giant trafficking thing. I mean, oh my the God. trafficking thing is so, it's so big overall, even I just heard recently too, another major figure, but Mel Gibson, oh, he's doing some documentary or something about trafficking. Oh, no, no, his agent said, no, he has nothing to do with it. And he just, you know, interviewed yesterday and the, all he's talking about is that new trafficking film that just came out. So that thing's about to take off that subject, The Sound of Freedom. Oh, yeah, I've heard about film. that, yeah. Yeah, that... I want to watch that, that myself, out. yeah. That so. looks incredible. And, yeah, that's a very real thing, whatever it is. I mean, think about this. Uh, E.T. sounds scary, right? And they sure. come in, they're broking, prodding, prodding, and abducting us. And what sounds even scarier is if it came out that it was actually... Not E.T. at all, if it was humans the whole time doing Ooh. it, disguising themselves as E.T. That's even scarier. Government officials doing that to their own citizens. Yeah, that would be a new one on us and uh, everyone else. And um, I was going to ask you as well here, there's some whistleblowers that were claiming that extraterrestrials have engaged in some sort of um, battle with, with uh, you know, with us before and killed several <laughs> humans. You know, you hear and read about yeah. these sort of claims. Uh, what do you make of that, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, I think that whatever their technology is being that advanced, if they wanted to wipe us out, you know, they just have to flick out something, you know, from the asteroid belt, and boom, we'd, we'd be gone. Like, are you kidding me? It'd be so easy. Uh, or their weapon system must be so advanced. So That's what you know, I'm I thinking. Just don't think, I don't think it makes any sense for them to, why would they come? Because they're getting off, they're enjoying seeing us tortured. Once again, they have moved past that point in their evolution because they would not exist if they were still doing those. It just wouldn't be possible. Uh, torturing and, and battling and killing, once again, that sounds very human to me. That sounds like a very human thing to want to kill, to take, to dominate, to an evolved, awake, a truly awake grown species. That to me would be like, whoa, they're educated. They moved past that point. They don't need to harm. They're way past that. Why would they do that? They don't need to do that. So they've obviously evolved to a new level where that child's play is out now. So that's where I think they're at, man. We're, right. we're still stuck in that. So it gets confusing because you have the half truth. Half the government wants you to know. There's these whistleblowers coming out. Some people are taking incredible. Other people are trying to discredit them. It's it just feeding that circus, man. Oh, my God.
they're missing the point it seems crazy right now and of course claims of fake of a, of a fake alien invasion plan was out there as well oh, during God. this conference a demonic interdimensional forces and the use of advanced technology for mind control and the holograms yeah. also mentioned during uh, this conference and again i'm with you I, I feel like some of these people are legit and some others uh not so much it, it's it's also tough too because my uncle who i talked about in previous shows my uncle john he worked in the navy he was a, a captain on submarines for 22 years and then he worked for lockheed after and he worked on projects where they'd have 50 people at the facility all 50 of them were working on something different and some projects did not exist so some people they retire one day the nda the disclosure agreement is gone so they could talk or some of them it doesn't end and they talk and they think what they were working on for 30 years was a real thing and it wasn't they do that because usually there's a small faction that will talk eventually and it's usually when it's not the truth so that they're, they're relaying a false narrative it gets out, you know, they're evil or this and that. And I think if that was really the truth, those people would not be able to even say that. It would, they would not even get the chance to relay that because it would be so sensitive. So I'm very skeptical when they talk about these evil alien things. It sounds, once again, it sounds human. It sounds staged. It sounds like there's an agenda and it's going to feed the complex. It's going to feed the machine that Kennedy was warning us about and, and even before that. You know, we got to be wary of them, man. Like, listen to our elders, man. They were trying to save us. And what we're doing right now, uh, you know, our, our grandparents would wake up out of their graves right now and smack. My grandfather would smack me in the head if he was alive, you know? What are you doing? What are you guys doing in this, this world, man? Uh, you know, overall, man, we got to change. And we can and we will. We are going to make it out of this. I do not see a gloom and doom. I do, I've never seen any sort of end of day scenario no i not one bit not at all we will make it we will make it out of this but it's going to take people like myself like yourself keep doing what we're doing and continue to help people around us to have a format to share the truth and get out of this rut absolutely and andrew i know we are sort of short on time here and i do appreciate your time here but yeah. just to get a skeptical sort of question in for the skeptics out there just to satisfy sure. them I thought I would throw this one out at you, and many people remain skeptical about psychic abilities and communication with spirits. How do you respond to those who believe that these sort of, this sort of phenomena are it's basically simply illusions or product of the human imagination? What do you say to those folks out there who say things like that? Yeah, I think it's a valid point with a lot of people because you have frauds out there that are going on national TV or wherever, and you know, walking up to people and doing readings on them on the spot, that, that that's, you, number one, you don't do that. That's not ethical. That, to me, seems staged. That seems like BS. So if it looks like BS, if it sounds like BS, it probably is. But if you right. go with somebody with, with a track record that's proven and, you know, with almost none or none of people saying, oh, man, you know, that was BS. If everyone's saying, wow, man, I, I don't know how to explain it. Well, it's worth investigating and looking into. And if something is looked into scientifically, you look at the CIA, all the documents are online about the, Mon you know, the Monroe Group, uh, all these projects that they had, Project Stargate, all of these things. I have done work, psychic work with the Monroe Group in New York. Um, I know them very well, Monroe Institute. So th this is all things that have been looked into for ages. And what's good is you can also apply this and try these techniques. Anyone can. As long as you're open to this, you can try this. If you're not interested in accessing that part of your mind, that's fine. Once again, this is not for everyone. This is like anything. Uh, not everyone wants to be a firefighter. You know, not everyone wants to be a cop. You know, especially not. Uh, you yeah, know, just not, not today. For everyone. <laughs> you're so, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I get it, man. I would not press someone to, oh, you just got to get a good job. You got to get a No, no, man. It's, that's not for everyone. So stick with what you want. Be skeptical. Always be skeptical and ask questions. You have the right as a consumer you go to somebody for a reading or if you want to do that, go there and you have the right to ask questions. You have the right to report it. And if something doesn't sound right, you have the right to call them out on it. You know, like anything. I don't withhold anything, man. I'm, you know, people have known me for 13 years. I have a 13-year track record doing this. I could just speak for myself. I don't affiliate with many psychics because a lot of them are nonsense. And I don't know them well enough to speak for them. So I'm very selective with the ones that I do talk about. They uh -huh. need to have... A track record so yeah man um add to 
you know, as far as psychic stuff and also UFO stuff as well. Be skeptical with that. Just because someone has photos and videos or whatever and they claim this, no, they should have these looked into just so your audience, they're listening now. I was recently in a show on A&E and it's all of the world close encounters down under. I'm in episode four with my UFO footage analyzed by the national director of MUFON, Australia and New Zealand. Took my footage, analyzed it in the show. And basically in there, he says, yeah, it's 100 percent unknown. We don't know what it is. It's nothing we have. So I don't need to share that. I don't care about photos and videos. Honest, I really don't. I know what I'm seeing is really I always have known. But it is good for the skeptic out there. It's good for the person not sure to look into that stuff because you don't know what's out there with CGI and all that nonsense. People can make these things look real and they're not. So, yeah, man, you have the right to look into that. You should get your stuff looked at to make sure it is legit. Very nice. Well, once again, Andrew, I do want to thank you for your time and um, energy here on this program. You know, I do appreciate it. And uh, Andrew, we will do it again on the other side, my friend. Anytime, Michael, you know how to find me. Anyone that needs to reach out to me, I'm on all the socials and you'll put my link up, man. If anyone needs me, they know how to track me down. Right. Yes. And uh, your website is for those who want. want yeah, yeah, it. sure. My website is really easy. It's called thepsychicfirefighter.com really easy very simple there you go boys and girls the <laughs> psychicfirefighter.com go there if you want more information from our guest and andrew once again always a honor and pleasure to have you here we'll do it again amazing michael you take care man thank you so much i do want to thank you for hanging out with us this weekend we will return shortly special thanks to all of you out there in the chat room right now i can see you don't worry i know you're out there oh yes patreon.com forward slash michael deacon that is where gold falls from the sky you don't want to miss it now, that concludes tonight's evening. I will return on the other side. And with that said, the world is a mysterious place, and life itself is a mystery. Until next time, good night. <laughs>